Welcome to Essential Dynamics. I'm your host, Derek Hudson. Excited today to talk with my colleague, Dave Kane. Dave, welcome. <laughs> Thanks. I think I sort of invited myself back by, by not answering the question I started the last one with. So, Well, we're, we're not done yet. So Essential Dynamics podcast has uh, been created to explore the concepts of Essential Dynamics through deep conversations with interesting people. And Dave's chosen me to be the interesting person today. Um, turn, turning the tables a little bit. So Dave, thanks very much for the conversation we had last time. I feel like we have unfinished business. Where do you want to start? Well, so last time we were talking about uh, sort of a blog you put up about you better build a birdhouse, which was all about, you know, getting to the action. Um, let's get to improve your, your system and increase more value as opposed to just always planning or thinking. And we went off talking about sort of how do you know where the right place to start is? Um, and so we kind of worked on that one last time. But the question I started out with was, well, why is this so hard? Why was it so hard to actually get to a point where you've identified what to do? Now go do it. Like to implement, to succeed, to close off uh, those types of things. So kind of what was your thought as you were building out your birdhouse here? So why is it so hard to actually implement a useful change to the system that increases flow? Well, there's a, there's a bunch of reasons that it's hard and each of them can, you know, take you down a little bit. Um, one of them is that I, I, you know, we hear a lot about change is hard and there's some changes that we're totally excited about. So it's not that change is hard, but this kind of change is hard because we, it's hard to see. It's hard to see what we're trying to do in an organization. It's, it's really hard to see what we're trying to do. It's hard to see the results of our work. It's hard to see the system. Um, so much of uh, the work that we do is kind of knowledge work. It's less tangible. And so I think that, I think that is hard. So I've spent, a lot of time in organizations helping, you know, you build out the strategy and then um, to just help. And so with the leadership that decides, you know, which we're doing first and what initiatives we're going to do. So everybody gets very excited about it. Like you sort of say, it, it's, it's easy to kind of get moving. And then we build a lot of time building all sorts of the metrics. And so we've, we're going to measure how this thing's going to succeed. Um, we're going to track the progress. And then that's where it peters off. So, you know, with, with the right diligence, I think you can sort of measure what success is going to look like. It's just, to me, that's where it, it the, the energy kind of peters out because, you know, now somebody's got to go do it or somehow it's got to get done as opposed to the planning stuff. Cause the planning yeah. is super easy and, and finding metrics isn't that hard. It's doing the work. Doing the work is hard. And so what, like, let's talk about for a second about what is, what is doing the work? Okay. And so we're talking about, I think about sort of the work of management, uh, which is making decisions and uh, setting priorities or parameters for decisions that other people make. Right. Um, there's not that many decisions that we make in an organization uh, when you comes down, when it comes down to it. Um and we, we, so we complicate that a lot. And so we're not, and a lot of times we don't kind of make decisions. We, we try to influence or we try to make a rule or something like that. But a decision is like, I'm going to spend money on this. Like I'm going to issue a purchase or I'm going to hire somebody. I'm going to change the price. I'm going to change the spec. Those are, those are decisions that matter. And, um, you know, a lot of times, in an organization, if you're implementing strategy, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to think differently and make different decisions kind of at their the level of their desk, their world. Um, and we're and we're not we're not kind of clear on that. So so we have initiative that says that we're gonna be more customer focused. And so we, I don't know, show videos and have a campaign and have t-shirts and stuff like that. But wh where's the decision in that? Where's the change in behavior in that? Well, it's, 
it's someone sitting across from the customer, or these days more likely on the phone or online, uh, and acting in a different way than they did last week. And they have to understand what the purpose of that is, how it fits in. Um, they have to feel like they're not being coerced, that there's some there's some uh, advantage either to them or that they want to have an advantage to the customer. And somehow that stuff gets lost in translation. And so your your strategy is, you know, we're going to have better uh, customer uh you know, reviews and the action. Oh, it's what, what, what get measures gets done. So I would just stick some metrics on top of these people. And that's obviously going to influence behavior. Cause if I measure it, that'll change the behavior. Right. My uh, you know, fantastic way of doing it. Yeah, but. You know, it, it, uh, it might. Uh, one of the things that we said we'd talk about last time is, you know, a little bit more of this uh, purpose path and people kind of conversation. So the people who are dealing with the customer have their own approach, their own style of stuff that they think is important. And um, what do you know, imposing a measure on them uh, might not have the um, impact that you want it to have, depending on what happened last time they had a measure imposed on them, uh, depending on how they relate to the customer and how the company supports them in providing value to the customer. And there's a story going on in the employee's head that you change when you change a measure. Mm -hmm. But, but in, uh, in the boardroom, you might have no idea what any of that is. And so maybe that's sometimes why this stuff is so hard is that the translation of the strategy to actually someone behaving differently. There's a, there's a lot of steps in there where that can get misinterpreted. Yeah. And, and well, misinterpreted and just the communication isn't always, you know, in a way that's going to make it work in that, you know, it's more of a degree or a policy or a direction or a metric. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of times if you take it back up a level and have everybody understand how the system works and why each of these actions affects the system um, or how it drives towards purpose X, purpose Y, or, or whatever the case is, um, then they're contributing to the system as opposed to performing a job with a metric. Is kind of how I would look at it. So, so uh, from what you're saying then, uh, and I would tend to agree that the ultimate place we can put an employee in uh, to contribute to the success of the organization is if they understand the entire system. They yes. understand, they understand yeah. what, what uh, the system then defines as value, um, how customer gets the, you know, their part of that value. Uh, and what that looks like. And then they understand how they can contribute to uh, the flow of value. Um, and I suppose that way back when Henry Ford was, you know, building assembly lines, that it was really important for the brake person to know the two bolts to tighten. And they didn't need to know anything else. But th with the work that we have now, uh, so complex, so intangible, and the workforce being so intelligent and having so much information available to them, you really want them to know what we're trying to do, I think. Right. And that, and it's not that easy. It's not that easy for a bunch of reasons. And uh, one of the fundamental ones is that the human tendency to deal with complexity is to divide a process into pieces. And, and we, we don't like, we don't like to think about too much stuff. And so we'll say, well, the, the process is we sell and then we engineer and then we manufacture. So let's have a sales department mm -hmm. and an engineering department and a manufacturing department. Well, I've been in an organization that had exactly those things. Um, and all of the problems were the interface between the sales and the engineering and the engineering and the manufacturing. Right. Well, because things are not linear anymore. No. There, there isn't that sort of, it, it's just that simple of it slides down the conveyor belt and everybody adds their piece. 
No, it's, uh, it's like, yeah, there's uh, iterative recursive calculations. There's uh, all kinds of ambiguity. And so we, we need to understand, uh, you know, as a minimum, what the, you know, workstation upstream from you, what their world is like and what the one downstream from you, what their world is like. But if you take that to any extension, you need to understand how the system flows uh, what your what your part is, but you can't be limited to that because, you know, smart people can say, "Hey, just a second here." I just found out that you know, four steps upstream from me, they're putting this thing on, and my main job is to take it off. And so let's get together and figure out, you know, do we need this component or not? Right. Um, and it like so, I think it's it starts. As soon as a CEO says you're in charge of engineering and you're in charge of sales. Now okay, there's so no, that's... there's no easy uh, alternatives to that, but that's where it starts. And, and sort of that, that piece of identification of you're in charge of this, that, I mean, cause a lot of what we just sort of talked about applies both to change, but also just to the effective organization and, and just sort of that continuous uh, improvement and everybody sees their piece, but take that piece of, it helps when somebody's identified as having accountability or responsibility and bring that back to um, this building the birdhouse of, of taking it from, um, you know, a good idea to do to actually getting something done. So how does that, assignment of accountability or the individual role help within this conversation of, you know, getting the project moving and completed. All right. So that's an interesting one because usually accountability is, I mean, I I've heard it said this way. I don't like the expression, um, but it's, it makes, it makes it clear what we're talking about. Accountability. Oh, that's which throat to choke. And I've heard that expression from, uh, from, you know, from more than one person, people that I uh, otherwise admire, um, you know, blame is not a great motivator. Um, okay. and, and accountability, you know, there's, I guess there's different kinds of accountability. I like to think about the, the term stewardship, which I, I think the definition I use is something like careful management of something entrusted to one's care. Um, and we can have collective stewardship over things. So sometimes it's good to have the chair of a meeting and sometimes it's good to have someone sign off and say, we can do this, we can't do that. But for the most part, if we're trying to protect our own space, what accountability means is I'm not accountable for that. Uh, you can't, it, the system can fall apart, but if I did my part, you can't blame me. So that's not, that's not productive accountability in my mind. Uh, initiative, accountability, having the ability to say, hey, just a second, guys, this is not good enough. We need to do better. Um, that's something that people, I think, step into more than they get, you know, placed on them. And Okay, so we, we've redefined the, the terms within the RACI here mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of mixed up. Yeah, mixed them up. Stewardship yeah. for accountability and responsibility is still out there. But how is that? I mean, it's still in the necessary part in order to make, um, to take this, this building a birdhouse of somebody's actually got to start taking the plans and building the house. And so mm -hmm. you're sort of saying yep. when somebody takes on that role of, of, um, stewarding it or, you know, making sure things are moving along as planned, um, that, that's still sort of that necessary first step of, it's not going to move along as quickly if it's just a general thing that everybody's kind of working on. Is yeah, that no, that's, 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 that's fair. Um, so I have, uh, I've grown up in project organizations. Um, and when I first encountered a functional organization, you know, 13 years into my career, I couldn't figure out why people didn't think project all the time. And then I realized that I had, you know, I mean, my first experience working after university was an audit and an audit is a project and the team disassembles at the end and a new team reforms and I have a new boss for a month. And then I have a different boss after that. And um, so I understood that this, you know, this project mentality more than some. So if you want to build a birdhouse in an organization, 
you need the view of engineering and the view of manufacturing. Uh, yeah, you can still have a project manager, um, but don't bury it in the silos of of the departments. It needs to be, and it's still you still need to rise up above that and see the system view, and then yeah, you can have, um, you know, people people with responsibility and authority to get stuff done. But it, you know, if you want to make a change to the overall system, it needs to be at that system level. And if, if you say, well, we need to do better and all the VPs say, oh, I'll do my part um, when, and take it back to their team, that's not, you're not realizing the potential that you can if you look at it from a, from a system level. So I think we're beating this one mm-hmm. down pretty hard, but it, it is a structural thing that we impose on the world that doesn't have to be that way. And, and like, there's a lot of things that are hard because, you know, the world is a complex place and there's risk and stuff like that. But, but organizational silos are one thing that, you know, we create that we don't, we don't have to create. Right. We create because it it's, we work within just because it's often either pre-existing or just, it's just seems easier of where well, you take this back and work on it. Yeah. Um, and, and let's divide it up into pieces and then the pieces report back. And so, but yeah. there's this, there's a system view that's uh, that's that's harder to get to. Um, so that so that's that's one reason that it's hard. Um, I'm gonna maybe personalize it and try another reason that that stuff is hard, and that is that each of us have our own kind of perception of things, and we we work in our own world, and we tend to get pulled into details. Whether you know we want to talk about that in the business or whatever. Um, and those deadlines and that reality of having to actually make the value move through um, is really important. It's all it's the urgent stuff. And it's hard to step back from that and look at how we do it. It's hard to do that on our own selves and our own teams and for our organization. And so anytime you've got a high performing system that's cranking out, you know, value, um, it's hard to to take any time away from that, even if that's to uh, look at a better way of creating that value. So just kind of being pulled in is, I think, m- it makes those things inherently hard. Okay, so I think we've sort of gone through and and realized it's it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to to sort of um, get the birdhouse going and to follow it through and staying at the systems level is certainly going to be helpful to that. Um, why don't we spend a bit of time sort of talking about how to make this work then? What, how do you take it and be more efficient at it? Or sort of what are your experiences working with organizations? Or even if there's a company that's done this really well, what did you learn from them about trying to keep this thing moving forward? Well, I, like I said, it's really natural to break systems down. Uh, so, so that's a problem that we have. And it's also natural for us to expect and kind of enjoy complexity. And so we manage complex. One of the ways we manage complexity is by taking the system apart. So let's not do that this time. And that's why we keep using the, this idea in essential dynamics of keeping things very simple with a purpose path to get there, the processes and systems, and then the people who do it. That's, those are the only elements that we have to work with. So I, I'm thinking of an organization uh, disguised a little bit, um, but there was a lot of chaos in the organization. There were a lot of good ideas bouncing around, and there was um, – the organization was divided into business units and functional areas – and so there was a lot of sort of sub optimization of these things and, and not a lot of perspective at the top level. So we start talking about the basic principles that we espouse in essential dynamics. And one of the things that they just latched onto, um, and it, it's in their, in their internal material now is we are a two purpose organization. We exist to serve the customer this way. And when we do the customer's life is better. They, they get immediate uh, payback that improves their life and their family. That's, you know, in the world that they worked in, that's actually what happened. And if we do that properly, uh, we create value for our investors. 
Right. So you're purpose X, purpose Y. So they got purpose X, purpose Y. They said, we are a two purpose organization. What do we have to do to maximize both of those? And this little team realized that they had a common asset, which was used to generate this value. And then different markets in which they served it, which were all chopped up. And they started to talk about the big picture of how do we get more flow of this value to customers? How do we make it better? And immediately all kinds of things came to mind. And they didn't need to hire a consultant to do their own thinking for them. Uh, They just needed to kind of pose the question at the right level and have the right people talking about it. And they were immediately able to further integrate the organization around that purpose. Now they use a lot of metrics. So, you know, they, they, you know, from outside, you might say, well, they did the stuff that everyone tries to do, but there was a mindset switch in there where they got united around these, uh, these common purposes where they saw every part of the organization can contribute to, and they didn't compete with each other. And that was maybe a bit of a revelation to them. So, so as an example, I would say the simple answer, what we talk about sometimes is the simplicity on the other side of complexity. If it resonates with the people, then the rest of it isn't as hard. It resonates with the people, the rest of it isn't hard. Okay. And it also sounds like though, once they started creating these ideas, it wasn't some long extended plan with 16 parts to it. If, if it resonates with the people, it's, it's to me, it sounds like it's small bites. It, well, it's small bites and it's fast because, you know, if we talk about in the early conversation, we were talking about, we're just really trying to get people to make different decisions in the moment. And, you know, maybe you can incent them to do that, but if they understand that there's a way that's going to be better, uh, you can, you can have like instantaneous change. Um, and it, and it, doesn't that hurt? So you, you picked up on it, that word resonance. Um, one, of the, one of the things I describe about sort of the people side sometimes is that what we're trying to do is uh, earn the hearts and minds of the people. And you don't earn it by paying them or having a nice lunchroom. You could, you could actually lose it if those things are substandard. But the way you earn it is a, a resonance with the purpose and a resonance with the way you work together. Yeah. And I think, I mean, so often, like you sort of say in organizations, quite often we take complex things and we throw it into the silo because it's just, it's easier for us to deal with. I think quite often with the purpose path and people, when I'm having discussions with people, they like to keep it in one of those three silos. Um, And let's have a discussion about people with people. But what I'm kind of hearing with what you're saying is if you want to be winning, say the hearts and minds of the individual within the people side of, of purpose path and people, the conversation has to go back to, well, here's the path and, and the way we're doing it. But more importantly, here's the purposes and, and making sure it's all interconnected. And so it's, it's an incredibly complex way of looking at it, but it certainly needs to be done. And so I think that's kind of, to me, that key piece of, if you want to make these things move forward, everything has to kind of be interconnected. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dave, that's right. And so that's why we, we came up with this simple model of essential dynamics because it's, it can be complex, but it's actually at the top level, very, very simple. And we don't get that in the way we talk about organizations that yes, the, the people side is always there. And the way to connect the people with the task at hand is the purpose. And if we can, if we can get that, we get, the system does create its own energy. And And we're not. Yeah. And that ties it back to the the first question of, you know, why is it so hard to build the birdhouse? And, and if you can get that, that energy and that interconnectedness, it's not hard. And it's sort of each piece contributes its part, but it sort of builds upon itself. Well, that's right. And so maybe another reason, let's close it off with that uh, for the birdhouse metaphor is it all comes together and then we have the birdhouse. So the birdhouse represents clear purpose uh, processes that get you there and people that are invested in the purpose and the processes that get you there. Then you have a birdhouse. Other, If you don't do all of that, then you've got uh, a sketch 
or a mock-up or something like that, but you didn't build a birdhouse. Oh, that's an excellent, excellent way to sum it all up. So I'm, I'm going to leave my, uh, my questions there. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Dave, for that interesting conversation. Dave Kane and I are both with Unconstrained. Bryn Griffiths is uh, in the background doing, doing us right. And um, to all our listeners, consider your quest.